Tonight we enter a realm where the breath becomes the bridge between the seen and the unseen, where ancient wisdom meets modern science. Tonight our guest illuminates the path toward inner exploration through her expertise and mastery of diverse modalities, offering a beacon of hope and healing in a world seeking deeper understanding. The rhythmic dance of breath can unlock the gates of perception, guiding individuals through the uncharted territories of their subconscious. With compassion as her compass and breath as her guide, Carla Aspisberger empowers her clients to navigate the complexities of psychedelic journeys with grace and wisdom. So join us as we unravel the mysteries of our minds, where breathwork becomes the catalyst for transformation and psychedelic experience becomes portals to profound insights and self-realization. This is not just a show. It's a journey into the depths of human potential, guided by the gentle rhythm of breath and the profound wisdom of integration. Welcome to the world where healing begins with the inhale and liberation with the exhale. Welcome to the realm of Carla Aspisberger and her Moonlight Project. You're listening to the Michael Geeky Podcast. A podcast that inspires people to grow mushrooms at home to improve their mental, emotional, and physical health. Most people call him geeky, and he is a passionate mushroom cultivator, advocate, and educator. Every week, he sits down with fellow cultivators, mushroom educators, scientists, and therapists to discuss the various ways people can approach mushroom cultivation and how mushrooms can be used to improve their lives. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Myco Geeky, and I got a very special show for you tonight. We're going to sit down with an uh, uh, old friend of the podcast, Carla Aspisberger, to go a little bit deeper into integration. We're going to talk about how breath work might inform um, psychedelic journey. Uh, you know, I, I've had a few people talk about it. A few people say, hey, you know, have you ever thought about talking about breath work? And I'm sitting back here going, no, I have not, but maybe I should. And uh, so I, I was talking with her and she said, oh, yeah, this is this is like my whole jam. So I said, great, let's come back on the show and talk about it. So that's what we're going to do. The one and only Carla Aspisberger. What's up, girl? Hey, so good to be back here. Yeah, long time no talk. Uh, last time I talked to you, you were in Mexico um, and, and li living your best life. And, and then I heard you went somewhere else. Where'd you go for a while? Uh, so I went to live in Bali for nine months. Oh, you poor thing. Oh my gosh, that must have been terrible. How'd you make it? I'm surprised you left. I had a friend who went there for like a one month trip and stayed there for four or five years. I don't know, something outrageous. Just couldn't leave. Yeah, yeah. It, Mama Bali does that to you for sure. She told me all about like the street vendors and like, oh, I got this jewelry made. I would just go up and they would draw me a picture and I'd say, yes, I want that. And I'd come back. I have it too. And, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> see, there we go. That's true. She wasn't making it up. Nice. <laughs> Well, so that's great. And for what you're doing, not enough can be said for the, I feel like there's a connection between connecting with nature and connecting with yourself oh, for yeah. very obvious reasons, right? We are nature. The better we are at connecting with nature, the better we connect with ourselves, vice versa. So that sort of brings me to why, why we got you back on here. Uh, I've had quite a bit of people talk about various modalities of integration. Um, we also just had somebody on who, she isn't exactly a trip sitter, but she also isn't exactly an integration therapist. She is more like a trip coach, someone that, that inspires, you know, uh, doubtful people, people who are trepidatious, scared, whatever, to feel really confident to have that, that first trip or, or the next trip. And, and I, I think in talking with her and talking with several other people who have said, man, why don't you, why don't you do anything about breath work? I said, well, I, I know exactly who I got to get hold of again here. So, so here we are, we're going to do kind of like an introduction to uh, some of the main modalities of breath work. Um, but first, just for people who maybe didn't see your first episode, why don't you just introduce yourself 
give us some background about how you got into doing what you do. Um, and, and then we, we can go from there. Amazing. So, um, yeah, a lot of people call me Carla and I'm a integration specialist. So I have been, um, I've been journeying with mushrooms specifically for about 12 years now. And, um, just the first time that I took it, I become very observant and, um, from that moment, like something just really fell into place. My own journey started invitations, like invitations started arising for me to either go co-facilitate mushroom ceremonies. And I was one of the people that went back all the time, like, no, I need more healing and I need more this. And I was putting all of my power into the mushrooms itself or into the psychedelics that I've been using. And from that perspective, I'm like, wait, but how am I using this as a medicine instead of just a powerful source that I feel is healing me? So throughout that journey, I used my psychology, psychology background. I studied um, human life science and psychology in university. And from there, um, did a lot of coaching and Reiki, crystal healing, like all the alternative modalities, because after I've been a medical rep for five years, I'm like, no, I hate this. Like, this is not what I want to do. Um, I'm, I'm creating more customers instead of looking for solutions. So from there, going into the role of some would say the archetype of a medicine woman, um, I started noticing the big gap of integration, like people would do a journey and Two weeks later, like, oh, yeah, oh, I'm having anxiety again. I think I need mushrooms again, or I think I need ayahuasca again, or I think I need bufo again. And so throughout that, for a long period of time, I started noticing that what you don't integrate and embody, um, you will just keep repeating that experience over and over again. And then it becomes a past memory. So hence, I started pouring my love and energy and attention into integration and not the normal kind, but also including the somatics of it and breathwork um, has been on my path for a very long time too. And I just came into the realization that the breath is the only thing that goes with you on the journey. Like I've been in a journey where everything disappeared. Like I was just two eyeballs, like just perceiving. And yet there was a rhythm to that perceiving, like a a cosmic quantum rhythm to the breath. The breath is the only thing that can go with you on the journey itself, but also it's the thing that can start integrating all of the downloads that you get and all of the realizations and all of the integrate, I want to say like the new photon energy um, that's integrated into your system, into your DNA, because that the DNA holds on to photon energy, to light energy. So breathwork is the number one pillar that I use for um, integration therapy and integration coaching with people. And this is also my number one tool. So I only share what I know works and I share what works for me. So deciding if it works for you, take what you need and leave the rest. Like don't cling on to thinking that you're doing something wrong. If it doesn't work, maybe, maybe it's just not for you, but I've had, I want to say like a 99% um, experience where the breath really helps people integrate and even reach these expanded states of consciousness. Um, I'll get a little, little geeky a little bit later on um, in, in why the breath can also put you into expanded states of consciousness. Um, But it's a really good overlap and synergistic relationship that the breath has between expanded states of consciousness, which is what we get when we use something like a psychedelic or mushrooms in particular. You said something fascinating there. You said this sort of cosmic rhythm. I can tell you for a fact now for a a lot of this, I felt it was because I'm a musician and I thought that was just how I work, how my brain works. But there is always, even in, in right uh, visuals, whether it's close eyed uh, or for me, particularly open eyed visuals is there's always a rhythm. I feel like the visuals for me tune me into the rhythm of whatever I'm observing. So whether it's the grass or the trees or or whatever, I feel like more dialed into that. Almost like I can watch a tree breathe or I can watch the grass breathe. And so it's interesting 
you bring this up because now I'm like, oh, maybe I'm just actually watching myself breathe. Like maybe it's like maybe it's not that. Maybe my the romantic side of me wants it to be that I see the trees breathing. But maybe it's my unaware self not realizing that I will be breathing through that whole experience. <clears throat> and that is fascinating. So there's truth in that. Um, but on top of that, too, what you're seeing on a quantum realm, because I feel like we get really tuned into the microscopic view of everything, like you're seeing what is called quantum fluctuation, which is the way that the void breathes. And that like creates this motion in everything, like seeing everything breathing, because it is breath, breathing. It's just breathing. Everything breathes. The other thing I want to talk about first before we get too far into this is you so besides having a background in psychology i'm i'm imagining it's been you you've had a, a yoga mat rolled uh, around the back of your shoulder for quite a while right like you have a background in in yoga practices you you were no stranger to this so you you kind of had an advantage you were predisposed to looking at the trip experience in in maybe a deeper way than Right, like a kid in college who, when he's done smoking this drink, says, "What? What else you got?" And then tries this, and is like, "Oh wow, this is so cool!" But then just leaves it at that. You want to talk a little bit about how you felt some of that that background that you brought to the table, then informed, you know, maybe even an early early trip experience that had you go, "Oh wow, like the the breath is really important," or Oh man, I see correlations here. Like I'd love to hear some of that, the early experience and, and how the one informed the other. Oh wow, yes. Okay, great question. So um meditation was definitely something that I started really early in my life, like in my teenage years. And um it really felt that I was just sitting and trying to meditate. But in a sense, when I first experienced really getting into a deep journey with with mushrooms i noticed like how is this any different than meditation like i'm sitting here thoughts are spread further out i can sink into that substratum of awareness um i i don't have to interfere with what i'm finding like in in a pure sense meditation for me is the art of non-interference it's not the art of stilling or quieting the mind, because if if you keep thinking, oh, how do I quiet the mind? How do I quiet the mind? You're giving it another instruction and you're you're just like content always collapse and collides with each other. Right. So within that sense, um, psychedelics took me way deeper into my meditation practice and into my if you want to call it spiritual practice. Um, but the foundation that was there, that's like creating the discipline to sit. If you have a goal, if, and this is said, like, um, if you have a goal to sit and meditate, it means you're off course. You sit to meditate because you sit to meditate. Like, you don't sit to meditate to get enlightened or be the enlightened one or do all of these things. Like, you sit to meditate, create discipline, because this is the one thing during the day that the mind hates in the beginning but later on starts to love like oh yeah i know carla's gonna sit today and she's gonna just observe and do nothing and i'm not gonna like it but this is it right so how that influenced first of all going into my journey um was i always went into a journey with mindfulness like I'm not going to lie that I have tried going into um, a festival and taking a dose of mushrooms because I've always heard like, oh, I get so happy and I laugh and all these things. But for me, it was always, always like this introspection. So introspection that was done, but it was like meditation on steroids, man, like meditation on steroids, as in I didn't have this argument with my mind anymore. And when I stop interfering with, okay, there's thoughts. Yeah, there's thoughts present, but I don't have to pick them up. I can just let them be. So it really deepened my meditation experience. And then afterwards, when I did meditate without any mushrooms, without any psychedelics, it really created this, I want to say, fruitful environment because now the mind knows what is possible and how deep I can go. 
And now it's back to the discipline. It's like tying yourself to the mass. If you have the discipline and the motivation has fallen short, then it's the discipline getting you through that of, I'm going to sit anyway. I have to sit. Um, and through that experience, both were, I feel, in a synergistic energy type of the meditation helped me not freak out completely when reality was impermanent and constantly changing to a very big degree while in the journey. And to that degree, also the journey taking me so far away from mind and mental conception and logic, just purely into the realm of creativity helped me to sit when I am sitting in um, sober meditation to take me way further instead of clinging to, okay, yeah, this is supposed to happen. This is supposed to happen. So it kind of surrendered me deeper into the possibility of so much more that's available in meditation than just what you've read before. And that really softened the borders into complete expansion and reaching sometimes higher states with breath work than I have in certain medicine journeys. A lot of people talk about that first uh, big trip and the the letting go, the, the moment of realizing you can try to hold on and there's a point where you lose and you have to let go. Some people are way better at that than others. I mean, when I ride on a roller coaster, my hands are in the air. I, like, let's go. I was ready for it. Some people are not ready for it. Um, I have always felt like perhaps the, the unwillingness to let go could influence the quality of the trip, uh, particularly if 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 we're wanting, like you keep talking about in meditation, right? Like the minute I want to control it, the minute I want to force it in a certain direction, I've already kind of ruined it or I'm not doing it then. So if I have if I have something come up during a trip that I don't like and in my ego pulls into that trip and like has an opinion about it during the trip that can definitely conflate the experience it can make that more negative and and my experience has been the more willing to let go you are and look for the full experience without reacting to it or controlling it the less likely you are to ever label the trip bad it might have been scary but you would never use the word bad or it might be um redundant, exhausting, stuff like that, like if you get caught in some sort of a loop, but but you never label it bad unless you're trying to control it. So I think it's interesting that you come in with a meditation practice already aware of how meditation is in the beginning an attempt to stop trying to control so many things with your mind. And and then the trip sort of solves that problem for you, right? Accelerates it a little bit. Like, oh, you had problems doing this? Well, here we go. And and sooner or later, you're going to just realize you are not in control for a while. So I think that's really interesting. Um, the other thing it had me thinking about is when you're on a trip, you are 100% more outside your body and yet it is your body and the senses and the way your senses are being deceived or adjusted or whatever you want to call it, it is your body that is allowing you to be less connected specifically to your body. I find that fascinating. Talk, see, if that met, made any sense, maybe make it make more sense to people and then I think where I'm trying to go with this is I feel like the breath might be the thing that unifies those two. Oh, for sure. It's the bridge. It's definitely the bridge. So if I can share my experience um, from, I want to say decoding this, is a lot of people talk about transcending. And for me, the true transcendence is back into the body. When we are in those experiences, what I feel happens is that we no longer have the reference point of this is me behind my eyes and I'm looking down at my body. So I'm thinking about how my body is feeling in a trip or in a journey. What is actually happening is we stop thinking about how we're feeling and we're so fully immersed and we're just feeling the feeling. And then it's almost like the body becomes what it truly is. And it's this infinite 
cloud of sensation. It doesn't have a border. Like the border of your epidermis isn't really the border. Like there's no border here. Like the air around you is penetrating into your epidermis and into your skin and your skin is sharing like with, there's no border really. So when you're completely immersed in allowing the feeling to just be and to just feel instead of thinking about the feeling, then we no longer, we're no longer caught up and like gravitate towards this pivot point behind my eyes. And I am the one looking in towards my body. Then there's just sensations and all sensations are really, they become aware of themselves, right? Like we're a sentient being which means that every single sensation that arises and that falls is like an ocean wave. Like it becomes aware of itself and without the border, you can be like, Whoa, stomach. And then, Oh, but where's the stomach? Like, no, it's just this, if you sink into it, and this is what meditation can also start teaching us is, um, there's no, like, there's no border between, the awareness of things and also the thing that's happening. So if you are using sound, if there's just sound, this is why I love sound healing so much. And for, I went to Nepal to study this. Like if you're hearing a singing bowl and you can just hear that sound, like that really beautiful ringing sound and you lose yourself in that sound, there's just hearing. There's no one hearing anymore. There's just hearing. And the same goes with feeling. Like if you're in a journey and you're feeling something so intensely, there's just the feeling. And if I can link this back towards, this is what, what integration really is, right? Coming back into the body. The more you're embodied, the more you can reach up. So the deeper your roots grow, the higher your branches can go. So the more you sink into this meat sack, the further your experience expression and experience can actually just allow the feeling because the body doesn't understand language. That's the mind trying to read the body and call it me and claim it from the ego side. So if I link this back to you mentioned, like you will never say that it's a bad trip if you allow more. So this, in my experience, um, and working with a lot of people that I always bring this back to the the, the breath is the bridge between the content and the context. So a fun little way that I explain this is context really changes the content. If you think about a rose, this is the content. If you take this rose and you place it on, um, if you place it in a gun, it really means something. So the context being the gun, right? Or if you take this rose and you place it in, um, let's say you place it in a beautiful garden, that's going to change the way that we perceive the content or we take that rose and we put it on a gravestone. It's going to change the way that we see the content, right? So in a bad trip, um, so to speak, I feel that it's just giving you a perception and an indication where you're looking from. Are you looking from a mindset that is a cognitive distortion? Like, is this a cognitive distortion that wants to wake up and be known? Because all of our ignorance is just seeds planted for awakening to happen. They want to be aware of, or they want us to be aware of. They want consciousness to actually see them. So let's say that you're having a really challenging trip and you're going through some cogn cognitive distortions of um, jumping to conclusions or disclaiming the positive, or, I mean, there's, there's a list of 15 plus cognitive distortions that we can go through. When we start realizing this and then the cognitive dissonance on top of that, then it's like, are you going to cling on to the content itself or are you going to cling to the context? Like the context is the awareness. Like what is aware of this? So now things get really interesting, but I'm going to try to keep it as simplistic as possible. It's really not complicated. The mind's going to try to complicate this, but here we go. Have you ever noticed in a trip or without a trip, that your awareness of sadness is never sad. When you're super angry, your awareness of anger is never angry. Even your awareness of excitement is never excited. So within a trip, like if you can notice both of them without preference, that's the complete experience. And if you're so fully submerged within your experience and within your journey, then you have both 
at an interplay like you flow between the awareness of the of the sadness and the sadness itself and sometimes you lose yourself in the sadness and then you're aware and you can completely observe the sadness and again without any preference to this because awareness doesn't have a preference the mind has a preference because the mind has likes and dislikes when the minds have likes and dislikes, it's going to, through conditioning, always pull towards the pleasure and it's going to push away the pain. But without any preference, awareness even allows the thought of preference to arise within it, but it has no preference to that either. Dang it. Okay. <laughs> yes. So I, that just made me think there have been times, so, right, so I'm fighting with my wife and we're getting so mad at each other. There are actually moments where there's another part of my brain that goes, wow, look at us. We're so absurd. We're just fighting over the dumbest thing. And that is an actual part of my brain. Like you said, that part isn't like mad. That part isn't mad at my wife. That part isn't even mad at me. That part is just like kind of watching that occur. And that is a fascinating concept that you could just even being aware of that, right? We do that all the time, uh, right? I remember as a kid, I have ADHD. I was undiagnosed till an adult. I ran out of gas all the time, like probably happened 16 times as a kid. And uh, I would, every time it happened in my head, there would be so much anger and frustration of like, how did you do this again? And then there would be this other voice that would be like, yeah, this is, this is what you do, but you know how to do this. It's okay. You're just going to go walk down to the corner and get some more gas and blah, blah, yeah. blah, right? It's so interesting that there is the feeling that is in the body and, and being experienced through the body. And the mind is, of course, still, the brain is still part of that body. But then there really is that separate conscious, typically the ego, that has this whole other awareness. And it's just sort of like make trying to make it thinks it's better than your body it's trying to make decisions for your body but yeah it's it's rarely like heavily invested in in what your body is feeling and then there's just this conscious existent field that's neither the ego nor the mind right like um they 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 whoever they are um but a lot of people believe in the darwin effect as I would call it, as an upward causation. So they believe then that um, matter creates consciousness. So first is the matter and then is the consciousness. But there is a downward causation that consciousness actually crystallizes into matter. Now, when we have that perspective and view of things, then we start realizing that the body doesn't produce consciousness but consciousness actually has the body inside of it, right? So if we're expanding into that field of consciousness, then it's like, wow, the body appears within the consciousness of what I am. So if we're trying to, let's say, get rid of anger or get rid of sadness or get rid of grief, which these are typical things that really come up and give us a really hard time in a journey, like, how can I be free of you, anger? How can I be free of you, grief? How can I be free of you? If we're in this bubble, I want to say this field of consciousness instead, or this pure stillness awareness, same thing. We're looking at it from a different perspective. And that's why we call it something different. When that happens, then you realize, oh, I am the freedom in which this arises. There's nothing to get rid of. The anger can be here the sadness can be here in what i am because just like the space is not influenced at all by what appears there it's not tainted it's not stained it's not cracked you take that away and the space is just completely pure space again that's your awareness so that's also why it's never infiltrating it's never um in in conflict with whatever arises there so in that sense too like that's where the breath becomes the bridge between the content and the context. So for, yes. for a lot of people, um, the way that they breathe during a day would be like, oh, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm not breathing. Oh, 
remember to breathe. So there's irregular pauses between their inhales and exhales. Now, if we look at an emotional intelligence breath, it's consciously connected. Consciously connected, meaning that there's no pauses between the inhale, no pauses between the exhale, and we're breathing deep down using the full capacity of the lungs. When we're doing this, the more we breathe, the more we feel. That's why people stop their breath, because they are afraid to feel. They would rather, the moment that we stop our breath, we're thinking about how we're feeling instead of how we're feeling. So as we have like a conscious connected breath that doesn't stop on the inhale or the exhale, like there's a pivot point where it switches over, but it doesn't stop between there. And that's where we can use the breath to build the bridge to feel more. The longer the breath, the longer you feel, right? And also the longer that the breath is and the more qualitative the breath is, so rhythmical, a rhythmical, deep, slow breath is a qualitative breath. A short like irregular breath is a really short and um yeah it's not a good quality breath so it also teaches us like notice for a lot of people i would notice their breath if i'm facilitating a journey because if they're clinging onto their breath i know that they're dealing with something that is extremely painful difficult or challenging that they would probably lev- um, label as um, bad for that perspective of it. But it's just the mind creating contrast to try to understand that. So that's how the breath builds the bridge between this context, content, awareness, and also your three-dimensional being, like your sex, your heart, your head. This is a very interesting thing. And some people might think it's really woo-woo. It's really like, it's... It's just a reality of how things are. If you think about your body being your three dimension, your sex or your creative force is your third dimension. This is where most people get stuck and they live only there. Your head is your fourth dimension, which is your third dimension, an object that can move linearly through time into the future or into the past. Now, if that happens, this is normally when, if the fourth dimension, your mind is moving into the future, this is normally when people experience anxiety within their body because the body cannot go anywhere. The breath cannot go anywhere. It's here in the third dimension. So when it's going into the past and it tries to pull the body into the past, you feel lethargic and depressed and heavy. So that's the fourth dimension. Then you have the fifth dimension, which is your heart, your etheric emotions. Like this is just a spontaneity. There's no planning, no cause, no effect. It just is what it is. If these three are not communicating with each other, and again, a conscious connected breath is what connects these three and allows them to communicate equally, then you're in harmony with yourself. Then the three different languages is connected through a language that doesn't need words, but through energy itself. And when that connects, then you notice like, wow, okay, I can get a yes from my body, my mind, and my heart. If this is not connected, and normally people dealing with either sexual trauma or people dealing with any kind of trauma, like these three are out of alignment. So I would say this is most often how orgasms happen for most people without even knowing it. Like, oh, my body says yes. My mind says this is bad. No, I ha- should not do this. But my heart is like, oh, I'm conflicted. I'm confused now. I love this person and my body wants you. Yes. But my mind's like, no, this is bad. I'm not supposed to do it. And then there's disharmony. And you find that the first reflection of that disharmony is in the breath. Yes. I mean, there's no way that's not accurate. That that sounds so true. Now, I can tell you this. As you're saying all that, I'm thinking about more primitive times when human beings were roaming around the woods or the jungles. And, you know, let's say I am I live on some island and I primarily fish and eat coconuts, right? I, I need to use my body to climb up a palm tree. I, I, I get that coconut. I'm pulling some down or whatever. I have to breathe, right? Like generally speaking, back in the day, we did more activity. We were more fit in in organic ways, not artificial ways like going to the gym and artificially lifting a weight for literally no reason other than to get more fit, right? Like everything we did kind of made sense. And as you're talking about that alignment, I was like, oh yeah, everything was aligned. If you go way back before civilization, everything was aligned. 
there was no civilization to unalign us, right? Which is where most of that maladaptive, unaligned behavior and thinking comes from. Back then, there was nothing wrong with, I, I got to climb a tree to get a coconut. I got to stab a fish to, to eat dinner tonight. Exactly. And there was always that breathing because so much of what we did required effort without even meaning to, we were more connected to the, to that breath. So given the way we live now, unless you want to just like, like, dude, I saw some guy on Instagram. He like pretends to be a, a, a gorilla and he like teaches other people. And I'm like, this is weird, but this is also cool and, and inspiring in some very bizarre way. And I'm like, not everybody's going to do that, but people can do breath work. People can, even, man, I'm thinking if you're doing formal breath work and thinking about these things, having these paradigm shifts, even the way you exercise would change. You oh. you would, I like, man, I remember when I did lift weights, I remember watching guys just like using momentum and overdoing it. Whereas the, the real pros, they, you know, they had like, it was all linked to their breath, right? Two up, four down. They had, and it was Every like wise person seems to link so many of their behaviors to breathing. So yes, 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 and yes. All right, so let's do that. I love all this. Let's actually talk about some some of the modalities of of breath work that you you work with. Okay, awesome. Um, so especially or specifically when we're going into a journey, integration for me is also preparation. So if I know that someone is planning a journey, I would say we prepare with a breath and we prepare with a breath to notice like what is your, first of all, what is your habit of breathing before we try to alter it or to pay attention to how it's supposed to be. So, and how it's supposed to be is you mentioned in the beginning of this nature. If we look at nature, how mammals are breathing and how babies are breathing, because babies are still breathing in the perfect harmonious way, like deep down into their bellies, you would barely see their chest move when they're breathing. Like their bellies is completely expanding, which means they're using the lower lobes of their lungs. The lower lobes of your lungs also has more receptors for your parasympathetic nervous system, which means you're not stuck in a fight or flight or the sympathetic nervous system when you're deeply breathing. So the number one thing that I always start to teach people is how to take a proper breath. And a proper breath in the Eastern philosophies or the yogi terms is literally called a full yogic breathing. So a full yogic breath is where you start directing the breath deep down into the belly, feel how the lower abdomen and the abdominal cavity start expanding. And it's not expanding because you're literally, your lungs come down that much. Your lungs stop right above your diaphragm. But because you're giving space for the diaphragm to actually sink, and that pushes down into the abdominal cavity, like the abdominal cavity has no other thing but to rest onto the perineum and push out. So it's not a pushing out per se, but it's a sinking of all your organs. And then they tend to naturally push a little bit out. So starting the breath deep down into the belly. And then from there, like as it fills that cavity and you notice that expansion, notice how your rib cage is moving and then noticing five dimensionally how your chest is, is um, also increasing in size. And then on the exhale, it's first the chest, then the rib cage, then the belly goes back in as you exhale. What a lot of people are doing, again, to avoid feeling is they do what is called a reverse breath. So they're inhaling and it's almost like they're pulling the air up from their shoulders and the chest is moving, but their belly is going in on the inhale and it's going out on the exhale. So that, it creates an enormous amount of stress in the body. Now on an emotional level, what is happening if we're taking this full yogic breathing is we're breathing down from the root, which is our connection to earth and other people and everything. If we're taking it down into the belly too, you're breathing through your wisdom. So for, for women, like we have this, literally this cave of creation, our womb. 
So if you're breathing through the wisdom into your power, which is your solar plexus, um, and then into your chest, your heart, and the apex of your lungs at the top here is your joy. So you're coming from your wisdom, you're breathing through your power, and then you come to your joy. What a lot of people are doing is just breathing into the top part of the lungs, into the apex top part of the lungs, and they create enormous amount of anxiety for themselves. So I can tell you, just from a basic anatomical perspective, right? The, the lungs are wider in the back and they are narrower at the top. So everything you're talking about makes sense, right? That all makes sense. Now, I got spoiled in, in talking about this with you. I'm thinking about how lucky I was that starting in fifth grade, I think it was, I started playing the trumpet. And I took it seriously and I got lessons and they taught me how to belly breathe from fifth grade. And I played it very seriously uh, in junior high and high school. I got very serious about it. I got some scholarships. I thought for a moment I was going to be a professional trumpet player. And now I'm just thinking like, God, I wonder how much health and wellness just being a wind player was provided from having a very conscious breathing practice that I had to use from, I mean, I played like three to five hours a day where I'm right. When you're playing the horn, you're breathing. Even if you're a singer, right? A singer has to do so much breath work. So that, that is its own breath exercise oh, yeah. all the time. I play a didgeridoo too. So that like full circular breathing, like you're exhaling while you're, <clears throat> while you're taking a quick breath in, but the exhale is extended. Um, a lot of people forget how to use their diaphragm to breathe. They try to use their chest. They do. Well, and again, to go back to like primal living, right? Singing was common. Dancing was common. Climbing trees or running around was common. We just breathed more. And we didn't have time, you know, sure, if the lion was chasing us, we would be scared about that. But we didn't even have time to go, I'm so scared. What should I do about this? We're like, right, we're just running for our lives. Now it's like, no, I have to think if I'm clever about this instinct kicking in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, oh, I wonder. Yeah, now the, the layers of thinking that occur now in our society is, it's, it's so complicated yeah metacognition yeah. is a real disease oh really oh my like god yes the um so so this full yogic breathing that starts with i i love this the thinking of it's not pushing the belly out it's the allowing the diaphragm to really settle into that cav the abdominal cavity and that opens up the the greatest bit of real estate in your lungs and then when that core real estate is opened up, then you're thinking about your rib cage, right? All the muscles in between your ribs expanding. And then and only then are you moving it up into the sternum and the, and the chest. And, yeah. uh, you know, even uh, like you're saying, the shoulders or the collarbone, like that's the last little bit. Yeah. And, and we had to do that, too, because there would be phrases, right? If you're playing a horn where you you would like to do it in one breath. If you can't do it in one breath, then the phrasing's garbage. And so you had to work on your, you know, your lung capacity had to be pretty exceptional. And these are all things that the average person that doesn't have any of those practices, that, that doesn't play an instrument, doesn't sing, doesn't do like very intense exercise, they're not thinking about their lung capacity. No. But they... God, what health benefits would come from thinking about it? That it, you, even if you don't go as deep and spiritual as you're talking about, just simply just saying the physiology of it, physiology like, of it, yes. Like if you don't use it, you lose it, right? Like a lot of people, the thing comes in between nose breathing and mouth breathing quite a lot. There's a lot of studies now that show that. If you're a chronic mouth breather, you'll have a lot of difficulty. Like you'll get up at night to go pee. Um, you'll have an underdeveloped jawline. You will have more cavities in your teeth. You'll have um, stinky breath. Like there's so much evidence now that if you're a chronic mouth breather, it's, it's really not good for your health. 
where is if you breathe through the nose it warms the air it stops certain molecules from entering so it keeps your lungs clean it slows down the breath so that it can go deeper into your lungs using the full capacity of your lungs and i always love to just infiltrate like everything is fractalized right and you notice this when you are journeying like you see fractals everywhere because it's like it's like a repeating pattern fractals everywhere so what if it's if it's flowing in your body it's flowing in your life if you are feeling it in your body it's it's energy and it's going to fractalize so within this like for me every single time that you breathe in like this is how you're taking in life literally and figuratively this is your life force in the in the yogi terms they call it prana in the chinese terms they call it chi like call it what you want but it's the life force that lives within the breath and the amount that you're taking in with every single breath that's how you're taking in life so if you feel like you're living small you're playing small and you feel like you feel super tight within your life like literally fix your posture and start breathing more deeply you'll feel better if you feel like shit i don't know if i can say that word on you but <laughs> not the you, worst word we've used on the show i can assure you if you if you really feel bad i invite you to notice what your posture looks like because i'm pretty sure that it would be like it will be closed off your nervous system and the way that your nervous system is placed within your body literally sends signals to your hormone levels it sends signals to your mood it sends signals to everything so if you're crooked up and caved in you're going to feel that way because yeah. your hormones are going to produce that like everything is responding to your posture and this is why just improving your posture and even smiling at yourself like you can be it's it's a literal term like there's a medical term that you make yourself feel better when you smile even if you don't mean it in the beginning like you send signals through your through your entire body that's like ooh yeah she's happy wow that's that makes me think about this. So I'm thinking about when I was younger and whether I was about to get in a fight, right? I would change my posture. I wanted to be in more intimidating or if I wanted to prevent a fight, if I wanted someone to step back, right? I, I changed my posture or if I was going to approach a woman, I would, I would, I didn't think about it, right? It wasn't like, a, well, so my shoulders have to go back and now I do, right? You just, you have, you instinctively change your posture when you know you want something. Yeah. Or when you're, when you have an agenda on some level, when the agendas go away or, so in my case, I'm 47, I got three kids, right? I work too much. Uh, sometimes I'm just physically exhausted. So I'm, so my posture can suck sometimes just because I'm like, I'm exhausted. Yeah. But when you watch, for example, I remember dating uh, a dancer one time and she just never didn't have perfect posture and it almost just drove me crazy. And I was like, you're just like trained to always look like you're dancing, aren't you? And she's like, oh, yeah, you just, you know, you just get used to it and you can't ever not do that. I'm like, OK, cool. I am not a dancer. I'm not <laughs> do that. But that is that is interesting, this idea. I mean, and I've heard this before, the idea of, right, uh, if you're if you're in a bad mood, just smile anyway. And, you know, that's that's step one. It's probably true that it's a cool way to trick your body. Right. For pretend sure. to be happy is better. Like if you're not happy and you're not trying to pretend to be happy, well, that's probably where you're going to stay. So a crazy fact, too, is they've now scientifically proved that. um when some when women get botox and they don't contract the certain muscles like frowning they actually feel happier because those muscles are not contracting again they send signals they send signals to your entire everything is so interconnected so the posture the muscles of your smile it's it, i would also not really invite people to fake it you know like but smile and really just fall into your felt experience over and over again. Like come back to your felt experience. You will feel better, even if it's so subtle that it's barely recognizable, but you will feel better. And again, the breath is the number one adaptability. 
So change your breath, you're going to change the way that you feel because your breath is literally delivering light photons and um, like it's producing the chemicals. If you think about your breath influencing your cerebrospinal fluid, like this is your connection. This is your true connection. And I would love for people to start doing research on breath work and psychedelics and what that does to your cerebrospinal fluid. Like, because that's a whole new ball game and a whole new, like you have these caverns um, of the cerebrospinal fluid in your brain. And essentially when you sleep, you get brainwashed in the sense that they literally infiltrate into your brain. And then from there, they come back into their little caverns and then they run back into your central ch central channel. And breathwork, essentially, I'll get a little bit geeky, but I'm going to keep it as short and um, compact as I can here because I understand like we've been speaking a long time too. I don't know where people's attention's at. But so the cerebral spinal fluid is your conduit. Like it transfers ions, it creates buoyancy for the central nervous system to um, not, you know, push on bones and be pinched. Like if you've ever had a pinched nerve, it's not fun. So this fluid helps for your your central channel. So in the yogi terms, this is the seat of the soul, like your central channel, bringing all of the awareness back there. So this allows for that to be really safe inside of the central channel so what happens is every single time we take a breath so from if you look at the bottom of the spine the sacrum it's like an an a triangle that's um the opposite way around from that sacrum you have the spine and then it connects to what is called um the ivory cavern or then your skull right and in that is that is what houses your central channel and your central nervous system. So this cerebrospinal fluid, every single time that we inhale, this sacrum is pulling a little bit to the back and more cerebrospinal fluid is pulled up into the brain. Every single time we exhale, there's more volume, more space. So all the cerebrospinal fluid, like a little bit more, moves towards, towards the tailbone. So every single time we breathe, that is happening. Now, if you take this fluid, which has proteins and salt, if we add proteins and salt to water, we create an electrical force. If we have an electrical force and we start spinning it, we create a magnet. When we create a magnet, then with our breath, if our breath is fluid and qualitative and rhythmical, then this magnet starts producing a magnetic field. And what is a magnetic field that's pulsating? It's a radio wave or a radio receiver, yeah. right? <laughs> so once we become a radio receiver, and this is also the, the overlap that I feel that happens between psychedelics and also breath work. Now we become a radio receiver, not just for this ego me, small me, but we become a radio receiver, like beyond our body, beyond like for, for more intelligence to be um, processed within our consciousness. So when that happens, um, essentially what I think happens, and this is a complete theory, like I don't know what happened, if this truly happens, but during breath work and psychedelics, I truly think that the, the the fluid is infiltrating into the whole brain and it's not just in those caverns. Because also there's a point that's called the thalamic gate here at the, the base of your skull. So once that opens and you're rhythmically breathing with breath work too, like it travels from the side of your neck and it creates like the spiral until, until it hits your pituitary right? So on your pituitary, there's calcium carbonate crystals that's photoelectric. And I see these every single time, the magnetic force, when you're creating that, um, the cerebrospinal fluid pushing into your um, pineal gland starts breaking these crystals. And what's inside of these crystals is dimethyltryptamine. So these Dimethyltryptamine crystals. This is this is how you start experiencing a psychedelic journey while just on your breath, just doing breath work. So this is when people get high on their own air supply. 
Now your DMT or your dimethyltryptamine, that's not only in your pineal gland, there's some in your lungs too that's produced in your lungs. So if you're using the bottom of your lungs, that gets released there too. And your dimethyltryptamine is coded to your specific DNA in carbon. You have your specific carbon footprint or carbon fingerprint, if you want to call it that. And your dimethyltryptamine is specifically coded to your DNA. So now it's no longer an external um, DMT that's ingested, but it's from within, right? So then you get to experience your own DMT and you get to experience your own psychedelic journey without an influenced substance that you're taking. It does become a part of you and it fastens up that process. But through that experience, that is essentially the overlap, I think, is through the spinal fluid. Um like dissolving in the body all those particles like the DMT from or whatever it is, the psilocybin from from the mushrooms dissolves and it crosses the brain barrier. And from that brain barrier, it gets into the fluid and then it starts connecting to every single part of you, like on all di di different dimensions, physiology wise too. So in my perspective, that's also like a really good overlap. Um, if you have any friends here that would like to do studies. I am a volunteer to see what happens to the spinal fluid. I mean, that is a very interesting hypothesis. I, I like it. Now, I'll tell you what I like about all that line of thinking. For me, the the breath work, I've always thought, oh, sure, okay, we're, we're doing some breath work. Maybe we can do some shallow, like the Kundalini breathing, right? Where, okay, maybe we're like up in our CO2s. It's messing with... Uh, you, you know, the way our brain is thinking about respiration and all this stuff, and it's putting us in some some altered state. But you're talking about way more subtle, you know, different ways that, because this is true, it, whether you're thinking about like Indian, right, thinking about uh, the different spots in our in our spine and our body, or you're, or you're talking about chi or whatever Eastern kind of philosophy, religion, spirituality modality, where they think of this alignment from the sacrum up to the third eye. The, the correlation for sure, and of course they always talk about, right, just it connecting and flowing between the different spots. That's what cerebral spinal fluid does, right? CSF is, that's, it's, there's a, plenty of the fluid up in our brains, but it's also throughout our spinal column, uh, right? When I'm at work, every once in a while, we got to tap somebody. It's not a, a fun process, but there's fluid all the way down, right, to, to the bottom of the spinal cord. So that's a fascinating, like, scientific anatomical correlation between those two ways of thinking. So then in my head, I go, well, okay, so if they got that right before they ever you know, did autopsies and, and uh, had any sort of sense of human anatomy internally. Well, if they're right about that, well, then you got to start asking yourself, okay, so what is, what are all the things that they think and what are the correlations then scientifically speaking? So that, that all could be very possible. The problem from what my understanding with the DMT, the native, you know, uh, endogenous DMT would be that by the time you could ever try to measure it, it would just be gone. Yeah. And, and it's just, it, it, it's one of those things where not sure if we could ever really prove it's there. It would be through some very sophisticated science that, that I don't even know if we have yet to do that, but we know it's everywhere. Yeah. We know DMT is everywhere. And we know that a lot of these tryptamine alkaloids are, are everywhere and very fascinating uh, molecules. So I love all that love all that kind of thinking. So now, so full yoga, full yogic breathing is this idea of the, the belly. You're starting in the belly. You're, you're moving that diaphragm down, moving up into the, the rib cage. And, and then finally up, up to the chest. That's like that basic core. That's the first breathing technique you're working with people with, right? It's just a fundamental appropriate way to breathe. As someone who has had three kids, I can tell you the kids come out, right? The first breaths they take are absolutely that way, right? 
absolutely. And, and, you know, as long as their APGAR score is good, these babies are screaming their heads off, right? From within seconds of being born, within seconds of taking their first breath, they, they, that's the first instinct they have is to breathe. Yeah. Second instinct, maybe to suckle, but right. This is a core, this is a core behavior that we have that, that as we get older and we get in our heads, we, we lose all those things. I got too much stuff to worry about, Carla. I can't worry about my stupid breathing. Are you kidding me? I got to pay my mortgage. I got to call my dad back. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to check my Instagram. I got to pay my, right. And then, then we wonder why, why we're anxious, why, the number one diagnosis I can tell you right now in the emergency room, number one, every almost every single patient that walks through the door is either obviously depressed or obviously anxious. Everybody. Now, sometimes it's because, oh, I think I'm having a heart attack. Of course, you're anxious now because, you know, you're worried you're having a heart attack or uh, I'm, I'm depressed because I've had a headache for three days. But I'm telling you, it's getting way, way worse. Baseline, just everyone's anxious and depressed. And what if how we breathed and how maybe we decided to make a practice of our breathing could solve some of those problems, not to mention deepen our trip experience? Exactly. I love that. All right. So so once once I get full yoga breathing down, what are you going to teach me next? Okay. So next, I would then um, go into a bellow breath. So this is something that is, in my opinion, for me, easier than a full yogic breathing. But this is just, it's inviting you to have your attention and to literally sink the breath, sink the chi. So this is more so than having an intention to breathe into your belly. I always invite people to say, you're just paying attention. You're removing any sense of intention because intention is there to change things. It's good for certain types of things in our life, but when it comes to the breath, we just want to pay attention to the body. Like when we pay attention to the body and we notice that the breath, when we don't have any habitual patterns placed and superimposed over the breath, it will naturally sink down into the belly. So a bellow breath is literally where your chest is barely, it's not really moving, but your belly is moving. So again, your abdominal cavity is increasing and decreasing in size, and you're even breathing into the lower back. So the lower back, lower belly, it's like creating a bubble, a bellow breath, and it's coming back. Now, if I'm working with someone and I see that they have a lot of trauma, I would even tell them to pull their perineum up or to pull their pelvic floor muscles up and then do a belly breath. So this is also what is called like de-armoring because a lot of people, when they're going to pull their perineum up, their stomach is also going to pull in. And this disconnect that we make between a bellow breath, still breathing in um, in a beautiful big belly, small belly, while the perineum is pulled up, this is, we allow energy to still flow in while we're releasing because essentially when we think about the body and trauma it does not want to let go of any kind of trauma when it doesn't know that there's new energy coming in because it would rather hold on to old stuff energy than being afraid of being without energy because without energy means death so when we come to trauma and working with trauma and um, whether this is in a journey or out of a journey um integration before and after i see integration at before and after like doing that pulling the perineum and teaching yourself to i call this de-armoring the pelvic floor so you're contracting the mula bandha the muscles that you would use to hold in urine like if you really have to pee but you know that there's no toilet around when you pull that and still able to breathe down into your lower belly now you have new fresh energy coming in straight from mother earth and you're releasing because you're breathing into the lower belly, that's a really profound breath to have for your integration process, but also for your um, journey. Because we do what is what feels natural, but sometimes we mistake the natural for the common. Something that is common is not really natural, right? So we tend to tense into our pain and relax. We feel so relaxed and open into our excitement. 
It's actually the other way around. We're supposed to relax into our pain so that it doesn't get stuck. And we're supposed to tense up into our excitement. If you think about, um, and yes, this is an, an emotional level, but to bring it back to the body, like if you're tensing up and you're grabbing something, you're closing, you're contracting, right? If you're letting go of something, you're opening, you're surrendering. So you want to let go of your pain and you want to soften into it, which is the most counterintuitive thing that you can think of, but you want to soften into your pain and you want to contract into your excitement. Like, yes, I'm so excited. You're storing that excitement to resonate into your being and to resonate then from your cellular level out so that you can start attracting more of that. Wow. Okay, so first off, I mean, I'm I'm going to pretty much need a minute on that one, but let's just say this. Yes, people who <clears throat> are pushing anything away, especially feelings, right? They're, they don't want to feel feelings. Uh, w one book, I think this was the, I think it was this book. There's a book called The Dreamer by this uh, Araya Mountain, something or other. I forget her name now, but anyway, she she basically says like feelings have to be felt. And if you don't feel feelings, they're waiting. They're waiting to be felt. So she she talked about how she worked with, you know, various trauma victims that had just held on and had had never felt their feelings for, you know, 20 years. She starts working with them and they cry for three days straight because they finally just letting these feelings out. But that whole wisdom, that whole line of thinking and, and what you're talking about of like, you know, you have to you're you're in your mind you think oh i, I got to defend against these feelings i can't feel these feelings these feelings are going to put me in a bad place they're going to do this to me they're going to do that to me but instead you do the complete opposite and then you can have those feelings and hopefully move through those feelings and you're not then, like you said, your whole, it's the complete opposite of what you just said, right? Excitement. You want to get it all in and build it up because you want to build up excitement for some big moment. But we do the complete opposite. We literally do the opposite. I, I even think of that in, in a happy time, like, yeah, cool, chill. This is great, dude. Whatever, like whatever vibe we've been convinced we should have. Because it's not cool to get too excited about something. Like, oh, I can't be too excited. And that's that also I... conditioning, right? Yeah. Yes. Hundred percent. It's all. It's all socially conditioned. <laughs> yeah. Whereas it's normal to behave that way when you're excited. Like, it's like you ever watch The Price Is Right when these people get get on The Price Is Right and they they, oh, you're the next contestant and they run down and they run around and I every time I watch that show I think to myself, God, like I would never act like that. They're just acting too crazy, but they're actually in their moment. They're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're getting wound up yeah, because they're so excited about what's about to happen. They might win some money. They get to meet Bob Barker or now, now uh, what's his face from Cleveland, but yeah, we're just doing it backwards. Somehow we, we, we thought that was the right way to go and it's the complete opposite. So, so bellow breathing, mm -hmm. when I think of bellows, I think of like the old uh, medium format cameras, right. Or, or something, or, or like even like a blacksmith, you know, so it's, it's thinking about your, your lungs like this, right? Like this very free movement is, is kind of how I'm interpreting it for myself. And, and I can definitely see how, now, I don't know if pace matters for this, but I can imagine in, I, I have. In Hollywood, I did some acting study, and uh, they would definitely tap into some core trauma by doing this kind of thing, whether it was like primal moaning, primal groaning, but it was just like, uh, 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 oh, yeah. these kind of things. And that's pretty, that reminded me of what you're talking about, which is yeah. this like in and out, undulating breathing. So breath, movement, and sound goes hand in hand and creates alchemy within the body. So if there's something that needs to release, it will either come out in a movement or a sound or your breath. Or Hence, all of, you all hear, of those. Yeah, yes. Or all of or the all above, of for sure. Yeah. Nice. 
cool. I like that. Okay, so Bella Breaths, I get that. That so that's really good for for people with trauma. Even if I don't have trauma, it's really good anyway. It's every everyone has trauma. Like if you think that you don't have trauma, you're just in denial you're right. of your trauma. <laughs> you're right. That's true. Um, and then the thing that that breathing reminds me of is Kundalini yoga a little bit. Now that's it's hardcore. Um, yeah. I mean, I had one experience that scared me. Um, there's a lot to it, but, but it was that it was rapid bellow breathing mm -hmm. sort of. Um, so, okay, that's cool. All right. So, so I know how to do the yogic breathing. I know how to do bellow breaths. Is there any other, like, what are the other main breathing modalities I should be learning about? Okay, so um, just one that I want to mention is the pure intelligence of the breath. That if you're every single time you inhale, you're you're um, stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. Every single time you exhale, parasympathetic nervous system. So if you want to calm yourself down, then exhale a longer amount of time than you inhale. So it, taking a deep breath in for two seconds and breathing out for four. So that will really calm your nervous system down, bring it back into regulation. Um, and then bringing awareness to your central channel. So remember the central channel that we spoke about now and the fluid and all of that. Um, so a really easy way that I explain this to people that never breathe in there is I bring them four anchor points. The first anchor point is in your, what is called Mula Bandha or then your pelvic floor muscles. Pulling your pelvic floor muscles up and really feel your mind gluing in and sinking into, into that point. Then the second point is in your heart. So imagine that you're doing a bench press, bringing that anchor point in, really bringing your mind into sinking into the body here. Then the third anchor point in your throat. Like imagine that you're pushing your Adam's apple back like really feeling that. And normally people will start breathing in an Ujjayi breath or an oceanic sound, like creating a sound, hearing the breath. And then the last one is your third eye or um, just behind, like in where your pituitary gland would be in that same line. So it's, you can- it, even... Carla, it's where I'm at. It's, yes. it, it's where I always think I'm at. Like when yes. I think of me, I'm right in here somewhere, right? Like, exactly. Yes, that's exactly. how I think of it. So, so you can even flick your eyes up. To, so imagine that your optical nerves is going into your pituitary, like feeling yourself there, literally feeling yourself there. So, and then as you play around with all four of these anchor points, activate all four of them at the same time, you'll already feel so much more embodied and then imagine that there's a column of air or light or shaft or um, if you want an elevator between those, connecting all of those together. And then imagining like you're breathing up and you're breathing down and you're breathing up and you're breathing down. And then if you want to connect not just to yourself, but also to the universe and also to the earth, you can inhale from earth into your lower belly, exhale all the way up into the universe. Inhale from the universe into your lower belly. Exhale from your lower belly into the earth. And then you just repeat this over and over again as long as you possibly can. And while you're doing this, you're really bringing yourself into a meditative space. Again, this is for your journeys. And if you just want to calm down and bring all the attention and awareness back, um, this really helps too. For any situation, like people ask me, when should I do this? Like you should, when should you not do this? You when should always, you, right. um, like when, when always. should I, when should I breathe? <laughs> so whenever you want, breathing. exactly. So if you're consciously breathing here, a last really, um, important thing that I want to bring up here that I feel is super important is when you're going, for example, for an interview or at going on a date or meeting someone somewhere. We always have and tend to throw all of our energy onto something, right? Like I'm here, I'm giving you all of my energy. And what we don't realize is they already have their own energy system. They already have all of their own energy system within their central channel. So what you're going to do is you're going to push them away. And here's where that attachment style comes in, right? The ones pushing, the ones pulling. But on a quantum level, if we're thinking just about the breath, you already have your own breath. I have my own breath. So if I'm trying to push all my energy onto you, I'm pushing you further and further away. If I'm 
cooling into myself, breathing into that central channel, what I'm doing now is I'm attracting. Right. Like everything is now flowing towards me. Instead of chasing, you start attracting, you start magnetizing, and you build that resonance within yourself that starts attracting um, what is already within. Because if you have something, if you squeeze an orange, what's going to come out, right? whatever comes out is what's already within. So raising that awareness and frequency within, and then from there, breathing from there, you start attracting all of those things. Right. And I know that's true because I do that regularly in the ER. People come in scared shitless and I purposely am very calm. Sometimes I, depending upon the assessment of the patient, I might even start like cracking some jokes here and there just because I want them to see that I'm calm. Yeah. I'm not scared for them. Mm -hmm. I think everything's going to be okay. And by doing that, it for sure 100% helps the majority of people that come in. Some people are just so in their own little catastrophe that they, they, they can't even see what you're doing, but yeah, yeah it, it has a positive impact for sure. Um, me freaking out. Cause you're freaking out, you know, if, Oh no, Carla's so worried. I should worry with her. Yeah, that that doesn't help anybody out. So uh, that's interesting. Just even just to think about, we do want to do that, right? Because what we do is we go, well, I know who I am. I think I'm great, or I love this aspect about myself. Like, let's say it, right? If I'm going on a date somewhere, and and I'm thinking the, like a simple way of thinking about it is, I have to show them, right? I have to, it's got to come out. I have to show who I am instead of just being like, it's, it's in here. They will see it. Right. Like just, just Buddha, that shit. Just it's right here, guys. Like you, you it, that is a huge paradigm shift to, to have, or even to take that a bit further with the, the trip, right. The psilocybin, it is, it is working inside our body, right? It, yeah. It's not. It's just a pile of powder in a microdose capsule, or it's just a, a dried mushroom by itself. We are the thing that makes it magical, the way that inter it interacts with us. Even thinking about it like that changes yeah. that relationship. That It is me. I am the, the trip. It is just allowing me to have my eyes work differently, have my ears work differently, have my senses work, right? It's, it, if we think that way, that will change our relationship to it. Oh, it's only helping me, like you're talking about, it's only helping me be aware that my pores at any given time have thousands and millions of air molecules, uh, like, you know, oxygen molecules or nitrogen molecules or whatever else is in my air. And that there's really no separation that it's all just different densities of molecules from my epidermis to the air around it exactly my little geeky brain can comprehend that easily you know but the just to actually just have that not be something that i cognate in my head but that i experience and feel that's that makes a lot of things a lot easier. Man, I, I don't know about you. The older I get, the more little epiphanies I have and what I call like mini moments of enlightenment. Yeah. I realize that 90% of them are just letting go of preconceived notions. Yeah. And realizing that like there is no wisdom over there. I, I don't have to go over there to figure something out. It's right here. Yeah, there is nothing. Yeah. There's nothing. literally nothing there. Like even <laughs> the future that we project yes. into and the right. and the past we reminisce, like there's right. nothing there. Everything is just right here. This is the well, they say the only place where life exists, right? Like everything is here. So I would say be where your breath is because that's where life is. That's the only place where life is. Now, now, the thing you said earlier that also really got me was talking about how if you're thinking about the future or the past, the body can't be in those places. 
that was very interesting. That that's that's another little paradigm shift. That the minute you're doing that, the body is going, "Hey, what about me? Yeah, we're right here, right now. What? Well, where? Where'd you go? Yeah, like, where? Where's the authority? Like that? <laughs> that telling this body to breathe, right? This is also why I love right. breath work. When we are stopping the breath, we feel the urgency from the mental patterns of not being enough and needing more. If we're holding on the exhale, for example, and you feel the urgency from the body. But then it's like, nope, they are not the authority that says when to breathe. And then you, again, become aware of this consciousness, like that's the authority. Yes. And if that authority is not present here in the body, things go haywire. Like the body feels anxious and like, oh, mommy and daddy's not home. Like, oh, what do I do? I'm hungry. I need something like I cannot take care of myself. And then like, oh, here, right. I'm here. I'm present again. Oh, yeah, that that idea reminds me, man, like I think the first year I moved to Los Angeles, you know, I did all the Santa Monica, Hollywood things that you do. So one afternoon, I find myself in some apartment in Santa Monica, sitting down with some yogi from, I don't even, I'm sure it was somebody important. I did just some Indian dude, as far as I was concerned at the time. And he's given a talk to about 20 of us. And one of the things he brought up was he said, so the DNA in our body, all the cells in our body, right, they're, they're inherited from all our ancestors going back, you know, maybe a million years. And he's like, do you know that there is a pace for our, our bodies, right? And the pace is walking or running. Only recently did we start riding horses and then building cars and then flying in airplanes he said, so have you ever noticed that when you fly in an airplane, you can't help but be just a little unsettled? Like no matter, even if you're going to sleep, you're, there's just some low grade level of not being completely settled. And he's like, you think it's because you're up in the air and you, you know, you have a million reasons to be afraid that you're in a little can in the sky. And he's like, it's because of how fast you're going, that your, your literal DNA is not is aware of, of its, of its velocity and that it's uncomfortable with that. And I didn't even care if that was true, but just the thinking of your DNA in relationship to the ancient ways of being and doing versus now, like the ancient ways of doing these things are the most important part of your body, right? Going back 5,000 years. Oh yeah. These did everything. Now there are people, these do nothing. I mean, sure, this, right? Yeah. But, but no, like we don't make our food. We don't build our houses. We like, we don't attack our dinner for the night. Like we don't do nearly as much with our hands as we used to. And go figure that all these unhappy people that work in their little corporate offices, they go, I can't take it anymore. And what do they do? They don't go to another corporate office. They always go back to some sort of more primitive behavior, some primitive practice, right? Oh, now I just, I whittle sticks all day. And it's actually makes me happier than <clears throat> making a million dollars a year working for Quicken Loans. Yeah. Right? Like there's, yeah. We're just it's so like, mentally trapped. Like. So mentally trapped. Yes. Yeah. But so that's why <clears throat> no matter how trapped we are, and we are all trapped because we can't all just go live off the grid. We can't all do it. There's too many people, right? Yeah. Like if you take everybody in a high rise and put them out in a mountain, you know, side of a mountain somewhere, we're going to run out of space real fast. Like we've, right? So we can't all do that for a million different reasons, but we can all learn how to breathe. Every nobody has anything getting in the way of them going. I'm going to develop a, a breathwork practice. I literally, while we're doing this uh, this episode, I get a text from my wife, and she goes, oh, "Where is it here? Uh, doing breathwork. Uh, I'm totally zenned out. Oh, amazing. that was her 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 little message. I'm zenned out." So talking about people that is interested in learning breath work, I'm a master facilitator on this app called the breath source. They, um, so this is an app that, 
um, took all the breath masters from around the world, the best breath masters, placed them in one app, and you get tutorials, you get breath sessions there, you get absolutely everything to do with breath and more. Um, they're rebranding now just to the source. Um, great app. So not just because I'm on there, but I feel it's such a beautiful thing to start to start your journey if you're interested in the breath. I'll also send you some links if people are interested in these specific breathing techniques that I mentioned, if they want to experience that and try that out. I'm happy to share that with people. I mean, whether y'all know it or not, we all need to be doing this. I don't know anybody except for maybe Carla and maybe my wife's yoga teacher who, you know, is already doing this stuff. And I can tell you this. I, have you ever noticed if you meet somebody who's a really exceptional singer, that even their speaking voice has a, a more pleasant tone to it? Oh, yeah. I fundamentally know it's the same for for breathwork people, for pe yoga people, for dancers, right? These people that have accomplished anything, any skill with their instrument, meaning their own body, you can just tell. You can you can literally just tell it. It's so obvious. All right, so this breath source, hold on, I think I grabbed it. Let me try to pull it up here. All right, so it's easy. You sign up, you create a little account. It's oh, so it's on your phone though. I, I'm I'm on a computer, but okay, so it's for your phone. I like it. This is the norm now, right? Like the way we're talking right now. This is this is getting less and less weird for people. Um yeah. In the beginning, this was super weird for me. Not even here, but like even a Zoom call, it was weird. Or working remotely. Now working remotely for many, I mean, obviously a nurse can't work remotely in most cases. There are some <laughs> jobs you can't do remotely, right? Yeah. The guy that picked up my garbage this morning, he's got to show up to my house. But there's a lot of jobs that that work this way just fine. And it's getting more and more normal I can tell you right now, if people are not already in therapy, if you are in therapy, you already know this is how most people are doing therapy now. The, the like sitting on the couch, going to the office, that is happening a lot less frequently now. Yeah. So this is getting more normal. So then whether it's therapy or breath work, it's not, it's just not as weird anymore to, to start learning some of these practices or work on therapy. Um, in these new with the new technology it's you know this works you just grab your phone and you can learn about breath work you can um, you already know it works you guys bug me all day to ask me how to grow mushrooms right nobody thinks it's weird to ask me a random stranger questions and sometimes we get in super deep conversations and right this is the new norm it is not weird to have a relationship with somebody that you've never physically met happens now yeah so anyway that's cool I, I i we're gonna have to do we probably have to go a little bit deeper on some of this stuff but for now i think this at least is making it harder and harder for me to put off doing some of this work i'm, I'm pretty sure i'm gonna have to start gonna have to start formally doing some of this so if i want to start mm -hmm. Okay, I'll probably just use the breath source, but let, let's say even if I don't, okay, fine, I get full yogic breathing. Like, where do I start? Do I formally sit down and do that just whenever I can? Is there a amount of time I should do it for? What do you recommend for somebody brand new? Okay, so for someone brand new that has not built a relationship with a, with a ritual or discipline, I would say use the two-minute rule. Like, start for two minutes. And two minutes, if you're taking deep breaths, can be like five deep breaths. Start with five deep breaths. And as you do five deep breaths, like set that as your goal. Because a lot of the times we want to set our goal, like I'm going to sit for 20 minutes. And then like after five minutes, you're like, oh no, screw this. I cannot do this. Like I have other things to do. So, but as we start with two minutes, and then from two minutes, like, do I have an extra minute? Maybe I have an extra minute today. Yeah, I feel I have an extra minute today. And don't compartmentalize your practice to your life. Like that to me is the worst thing that can happen. As an integration specialist, I'm like, stop compartmentalizing. You can stand in the line at Whole Foods and you want to buy some food and you can keep breathing into a bellow breath or a 
central channel breathing, whatever it is, incorporate that into your daily life. We can listen to someone speak while consciously breathing, or we can be driving in the car while consciously breathing. Please, no breath holds when we're driving. But essentially, don't compartmentalize it. Bring yourself back into, um, create signposts for yourself. Something that I do with, with clients too is, especially with the after integration, is I create signposts like either get a symbol that meant something to you in your journey that had a positive feeling. And every single time you see that symbol in your life, you're going to take a deep breath. And whether it's something that you want to release, then you're going to soften. Whether it's something that you feel excited about, like you're going to create like an excitement symbol and gesture with your body like, yes, I receive or whatever it is. Um, or even with a color, like get a specific color. If, you're, if you have a really deep love for the color red, every single time that you see the color red, you're going to take a deep breath, a deep bellow breath, or you're going to take a full yogic breath. And you'll notice that you'll see, you'll see that color so many times and you'll start noticing how your cognitive dissonance and your self-sabotaging beliefs come in like, oh, again, red, no, I don't have time for that. Notice when that's happening because that's your mind trying to sabotage yourself not from doing that. It takes nothing and it doesn't stop you from entering and continuing your day just to take one deep breath as you see your signpost of the color red, for example. I like it. The only time I might not do that is if it's like red and blue and I'm being pulled over for speeding. That's probably the only <laughs> time that might be a little difficult for me. But yes, that I, I like I like the signposts. I also like um Oh, the start and small, right? Yeah. I, and sometimes, I, sometimes I think it's me with my ADHD, uh, or maybe it's just me. But man, I always just want to like. I did this with mushrooms, right? I studied how to grow them for six months before I started to try to grow them, and then I kept screwing up. And I was like, "Well, that was a waste of time. I should just started growing them six months ago. I could have screwed up six months ago and gotten this figured out." But yeah, so so start very small, two minutes. Yes, yes, so start and no perfection needed. Like yeah. perfection doesn't exist in right. this. You know how to breathe. Well, I'm alive, so I know I'm not totally screwing it up. Yes. Exactly, exactly. But, but yeah, practice. It's, it's our search for perfection that we stop progression from oh happening. Oh my God, it's, I don't know where we learn it from, but in the society I live in, I see myself and everybody else. It's perfect. What does it even look like? I don't, I mean, I know what a perfect circle looks like. I know, right. I know what a perfect mirror looks like, like certain things I can comprehend perfection, but like a perfect human being, what little thing, what equation do we do in our heads where we're constantly convinced that everybody else except us has these perfect qualities that we want. Yeah. And of course we can't ever be any of them. I can't ever be you. You can't ever be me. So like, it's the dumbest thing that we do, yeah. but we do it all the time. It's all pervasive in most people's heads. Yeah. And what a waste of time really, oh, right? Like waste of energy. If, if we can spend our time much rather like um, having gratitude. So this is also something that you can work into your breath, right? If you want if you're grateful for the things that you have, then you notice like, wow, I already have what I need and all that I need, I already have. So with this breath, I breathe life into gratitude. You're literally through the frequency of your thoughts and the frequency of the breath, you're breathing life into that, like on a very physical level. So bringing in more gratitude in those, in those terms and senses. Yeah, it's, I, I'm gonna say it like this. I spend a lot of time thinking about all the ways that society tries to brainwash us. If I spent that amount of time just brainwashing my own brain, my own self into higher thought patterns, better thinking, right? I bet I easily spend an hour a day just thinking yeah. about all the stupid little ways society tries to control my control me and my behavior. Mm -hmm. God, I could just spend that hour brainwash yourself brainwash your damn self why why are you so busy worried about i mean i follow this one guy on instagram and it's all little he's the only guy i follow i allow one little conspiracy theory account that i follow just because every once in a while it seems to ring true 
And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, it has no impact on me at all. Why am I so obsessed with this? I could be, I could be conspiracy theorizing my own self if I wanted to spend any time at all doing that. But I don't. I strongly, strongly celebrate and encourage that. Yeah. But sometimes it's entertaining to see what's out there too. Sure, sure. <laughs> right. we, I mean, we live. I remember uh, what was uh, what's that song, uh, Nirvana, uh, Teen Spirit, right? Here we are now. Yeah. Entertain us. Exactly. That, that that really he really just man he nailed that. We yeah. are now in an entertainment driven society. We love to be entertained. Yeah, we and do. We have plenty to want to escape from, for sure. But of, yeah. of, of course, the thing we escape into is also trying to control us and also doing all these other things. So it's hard to have balance. I'm a Libra. I'm always trying to find balance. It's not easy. Um, but but I like this this breathing. I, I want to talk about it more. I definitely want to hear more from more viewers who have any experience integrating uh, breath work with, with uh, trip experience. Uh, anybody who wants to try it and come on and talk about it. You guys can reach out to Carla. Um, she is a pro. I'm going to tell you right now. I've talked to a lot of people. This one knows what she's doing. She's, she's taken it very seriously for a very long time. Uh, she has just let the journey take her where it's supposed to take her. And who knows where she's going to be living the next time I talk to her. Because <laughs> she's just like a feather in the wind. She's just, you know, she's not resisting the cards that she's being dealt. And I think that's very cool, very admirable. And if you guys want somebody to connect with who might have some things for you to think about, uh, you could do a lot worse. I can tell you that. So anyway, thank you so much for being on Carla and we will definitely have to do this again soon. Amazing. Thanks for the opportunity. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Take care. You too. All right, guys. So that was Carla Aspisberger uh, and her Moonlight Project. Go check her out on Instagram. Uh, check out her uh, her breath app. That looks pretty badass. Um, you know, we're all busy. It's hard to schedule stuff, right? Like, man, I just read this article about how doctor's offices are bugging the crap out of everybody because everybody's canceling their doctor's appointments. Um, it's just how the world is now. It's just hectic and chaotic and busy and things come up. And uh, we're just getting real spoiled, right? Like we don't want, we watch our TV shows when we feel like it. We don't wait for Monday night at 9 p.m. Nobody does that, right? Uh, we want it now, now, now. So uh, same with our breath work. You know, it might be hard to schedule specifically a time to meet with, with Carla and, and do a session. Uh, so you don't have to, you can use the app. That's also might be a great way to kind of get exposed to her and, and, and some other people working on that app. Anyway, I'm going to check it out. It looks kind of cool. Um, and I uh, want to let you guys in on a little uh, little project we're going to try here. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, she, she was telling me, she goes, hey, you know what might be fun is why don't you offer a, a free breath, breathwork session to somebody, um, one of your viewers, and someone who wants to come on the show and do, you know, well, it doesn't have to be live, but, but we can pre-record it. But, but do an actual session and, and, and then talk to the person, find out what they thought of it and, you know, see, see what it did for them. I, I think that could be a lot of fun. So for those of you watching, if anybody is interested, um, just, you know, reach out to me, reach out to her and, and we'll, we'll find somebody and we'll do it. We'll, we'll, we're going to be about it, not talk about it. Uh, that could be, that could be a lot of fun. Um, and then for people who are trepidatious, who are scared, who go, I don't know, I feel I'm a grown adult. I don't need another adult teaching me how to breathe. This is weird. Cool. Be, you know, you can think all those thoughts. It's okay. And and then you can watch the show one night and you can watch somebody do it, see what they think about it. So anyway, uh, we're going to do that. So again, anybody interested in doing, uh, you, you know, a little experiment with us, uh, a live uh, or, or at least a pre-recorded live uh, breathwork session. Uh, anybody that's got that level of vulnerability or uh, freedom in, in their life who wants to come forward and do that, uh, I, I'll i be here ready and waiting to talk to you and we'll make it happen. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. Also, uh, don't forget guys, Stealthy Spores, 
We got these Myco Geeky Epic Hero cards, 15 bucks. You can also buy a deck for $50. If you want $5 off, you use promo code geeky. Um, all the money that 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 I get to that is gonna go to the Mycelium Revolution project uh with the Myco Mamas. I ain't trying to get rich off these cards. I just think it's cool that somebody stepped up to the plate, you know, made a deck that's playable. We're, we're going to be doing some content here with uh, some of my local boys. We're going to play some games uh, and, and talk about the gameplay and see how much fun that is. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, we got a, some pretty cool guests coming up here shortly. I'm not going to let too much out of the bag, but, uh, you know, all, all you guys that tune in every Monday night, I really love you guys. Uh, gl glad that you guys have kind of made this a part of your lives uh monday night you know monday is a hard day it's it's nice to have a little something to look forward to that evening so uh, i'm glad the michael geeky podcast has kind of become that it's definitely become that for me um love you guys and uh until next week go grow some mushrooms mm -hmm.